been in the mall a little too long, too much, and you've got that glazed over uh, kind of look in your eyes. And I mean, I, I went to Costco on Saturday. I haven't been to Costco the, the Saturday before Christmas. And that's a, an interesting and exciting experience. <laughs> kind of just kind of weave your way, kind of go like this. And you're going, <laughs> and uh, just uh, there's a lot of fun. And this is a happy uh, and exciting times. And I, I asked the first service, any just exciting or a little different, unique Christmas traditions that you have in, in your home or anything? Or, oh, right here, yeah. Wow. Big Jesus a birthday nice remembering hey why the we're doing the whole celebration that is great well paul naylor this morning they said we're a little different he said we have a we have a, a palm tree for their christmas tree I thought, well that is kind of unique and kind of crazy <laughs> but fun but fun anyone else have uh this goes kind of fun crazy traditions everyone just celebrates a little differently maybe and well uh I think I've told it before, we, just from the simple things, you know, we love having a, a, a Christmas Bible story, just the, the Christmas message read be, around the tree on Christmas Eve, and we exchange names often, and when, especially when we're all in town together, and cousins get Christmas presents for each other, and then uh, we do Christmas morning kind of under the tree stuff, supposedly from Santa Claus kind of thing still, and, and um, but for even the simple things, I, I think uh, going to a Christmas Eve service on the Christmas Eve, and uh, we're having the service here at 6 o'clock on, on Tuesday night, and, and uh, just putting Christ at the center of your Christmas, and uh, Nate and I, growing up, my brother, uh, we would hide a little, like, uh, uh, I don't know, ebony ring on, um, or ivory ring on, on an ornament, and, you know, you think of playing the hot and cold game, and it was kind of exciting. We would like to have the Christmas tree there, Christmas music playing, and we would play this hot and cold game, even as, like, teenagers. I mean, when those ones was little kids, we would hide them, on, and we'd try and see how good a job hiding on an ornament or in, in an ornament, and we'd be hot and cold, and I and, uh, just thought that was fun. And I find myself just laying my head down on a pillow on the floor and just looking up at the Christmas lights and having Christmas music play. And it's just it's an exciting, uh, exciting time of year, and it's just a hopefully a peaceful and joyful, hopefully... We haven't got caught up in all the other, you know, stuff about Christmas. We're just stressed out, and then hopefully we've kept Christ the center, and there's just something relaxing uh, about that. It can be relaxing about that. But the Christmas music has always been one of my favorites uh, about that, about the whole Christmas season, and, and just uh, taking it all in and, and feeling that peace and joyfulness. So I hope it is for you, too. But I, I saw this article that had the, printed the top uh, most famous or popular Christmas songs. And so I don't know, anyone know what number 64 is? Well, I do. And uh, 64 goes, goes like this. It was, it was recorded first in 1944 by Dean, Dean Martin. And it says, uh, it goes like this. When the weather outside is frightful And the fire is all delightful Something like that And don't worry about a thing Let us know, let us know, let us know You know, and I'm good at making up words as I go and stuff And so... My wife, some of you don't know that about me, my dad even invents words, but uh, my wife, Kelly, when we were having first having Allie, uh, she was pregnant with Allie, and her tummy was starting to grow pretty big out there and stuff, and so I made up my own song for her, and, and I, I, I would sing it to her at night, and then just kind of lift her up, lift her spirits, and I'd say, uh, I, when your belly's getting bigger and bigger, and you're worried about your figure, don't worry about a thing, let it grow, let it grow, let it grow. And, and I think she liked that. I think that was, uh, yeah, it was a beautiful song. And that's number 64. Uh, so maybe I haven't heard it that way before. But uh, And then the 20th song on the list was another one. We used to sing this on purpose uh, because it kind of offended Kelly's grandma. And uh, she'd be bothered by it, so we'd sing it all the more, just kind of tease her and stuff. And so that one, you kind of, a little knee slapper, you kind of get into it, and it goes, Grandma got ran over by a reindeer, walking home from our house Christmas Eve. Woo! You say you don't believe in Santa, but it's for me and Grandpa we believe. You know, and you just kind of have that, maybe that Duck Dynasty flavor that you've been hearing about all in the news and everything. But and I don't know if you know the number one song. Does anyone know the number one song? Drummer boy, little drummer boy. Well, let's, all, let's all sing it together uh, right now. It goes like this. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin mother and child. Holy infant. 
and so tender and mild. Sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep in heavenly peace. You know, that was actually uh, written by Father Moore in the 1800s uh, in Austria. And I don't know if he would ever have thought that that would become one of the central just songs or uh, parts of uh, Christmas. But uh, it's weaved its, its fabric. And I think one of the special things is about the night uh, and it happens. It's a Christmas song, other than not just like jingle bells and things. It's about the central figure of Christmas, about that silent night when Virgin Mary gave birth to a son. His name was Jesus, and he would carry the sins of the world uh, later on the cross at, in, in Easter time. And, and, and I, as I think about that and think about what are some things that we need just to focus on or concentrate on, what is new about Christmas that we can celebrate each day, I begin to think about what makes this one silent night so special and why we sing about it. Maybe it wasn't, it wasn't just, just about just that silent night, but it was about the 400 years previous, 400 years of silent nights that came before it. You think, well, Alan, what do you, what do you, mean, by, what do you mean by that? Well, if you have your Bibles today... You can go to uh, Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament. And it was actually written in uh, 430 B.C., when, when that, the prophet was there. So you, they estimate around 400 B.C., which is 400 years uh, before Christ's birth. And, and so you can actually flip your page from Malachi to Matthew, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and you just covered 400 years of history. And there's nothing written there. There was no, there was no word from the Lord. There was no prophets. Uh, there was no word spoken about God um, or, or any just message from God that there had been in the, with the Hebrew people for, for many years before that. And, but there's different silent times, and this is one of the silent times in which God didn't, God didn't have a, a word proclaimed to the people. And so when we think about that, we have to ask the question, don't we? Where did he go? What was going on? What was God doing? What was, what was happening? And I believe it's a good question. And the reason why it's a good question is because I, you and I would have to admit there's been some silent nights in our own lives, hasn't there? There's been some times where we've had to ask God, where are you? What are you doing in all this? What are you up to? Haven't you asked before sometimes, are, are you going to answer my prayers, Lord? Does it seem sometimes when you're going to the prayer meetings or you're going to the Bible studies and people are giving a testimony for the Lord on how God's recently answered some prayer and you kinda, you're kind of happy for them and things, but you're kind of thinking, why isn't God answering my prayers? It seems like He's answering everybody else's prayers and they all have a testimony and it feels like God's just ignoring me. And I think it's sometimes in the darkest place in our hearts, there may be some times where we think and you even question, well, is there a God? God, if you're real, if you care, how come it seems like you're just silent when I'm going through this, when this is happening in my life? I'm trying to reach out to you. There's been times, maybe this happened with you, there's been times in my life where it seemed like the more I prayed in certain situations, the worse things got. Has that ever happened to you? I remember John Chat, who we named this room uh, Chat Hall, and um, he was either, he either fell and hit his head or he was struck uh, down we don't ever ever know that was never kind of solved but I remember going to the hospital with him and, and they kind of told me that they were thinking that his mind might be a vegetable at this point but I would hold his hand and he would seize his hand in, into mine and, and clasp it and I'd sing Christmas carols to him because he died right around, around Christmas time 1995 and I remember the more I prayed for him the worse news I felt like the doctors were giving me I've had other friends with cancer and different things and sometimes it's like man it was just I think, God, I know, I know people are going to die, and we all have our time. And But there's these times I felt like it was sooner than it should have been. I felt sometimes that God was, was silent. So a couple things, a couple questions I just want to address today is, one, what is God doing in the silence? And two, what should we be doing in the silence? As a believer in, in, in the Lord and in and knowing there's got to be an explanation, there's got to be a way to, to, to overcome some of my doubts here and there as, as those arise or send stuff, and I want to doubt my doubts and believe my beliefs. I, the bottom line truth I want to get across today is, is never, let's never confuse God's silence with God.
God's absence. Let's never confuse God's silence with God's absence. We know the Bible's full of people who tried to take control during God's silence and had big, deep regrets, don't we? You know, Abraham and Sarah, you know, if they would have, uh, they, were, they were told that they were going to give birth to a son and he would be the son of, uh, in, in populating many nations, a, a land that God was going to give them. And Abraham and Sarah, though, with time and, and, you know, not hearing more from the Lord, like, well, maybe the Lord forgot about us or maybe the Lord wants us to move. Maybe it's time for us to take action. And so you know the story. Abraham eventually takes Hagar, uh, his maidservant, and sleeps with her. And they have a child named Ishmael. And there's a few issues in the Middle East that have been caused in the Palestinian uh, movement or, or, or anger and frustration with the country of Israel has happened in the Middle East. People say, well, we want peace in the Middle East. Well, it all goes back to this problem of, of, of a couple that didn't wait during God's silence. And there's much regret. There's much turmoil. There are much things that are out of sync because of it. There's also some great stories of some people that even in the midst of God's silence, they trusted still. And great blessing came out of that. Such as many of you have read during Samuel and, and read Hannah's song. Hannah was a gal that was barren, and she prayed, God, give me a son. If you give me, if you give me a child, I will dedicate him to your house. I will dedicate him to the house of Israel. I'll give, I give him to, to you, Lord. And, and, and she did. She had a son named Samuel. And, 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 and the Lord comes and speaks to Samuel, and they said it was the first time God had spoken to anyone in 400 years. There's that, there's that number again. 400 years of silence. No one, and, and here Hannah's in the midst of this, and she's barren. And again, God comes to him and, and, and blesses him with a child. She trusted even when she didn't feel his presence, even when she didn't sense, even when God seemed silent. Well, around B.C. 430, Malachi writes these words. 1-2 of Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob. And Jacob, of course, is the way God has decided to bless his people, the Hebrew people, through his son Jacob, and on there in the, in the lineage of David, and, and, and on and on and on. And in and, and this, this term, this, this tense of the verb, I have loved you, actually in, in, the, in, the, in the Greek there uh, begins, uh, in the tense is, I have loved you, I love you, and I will love you. It's actually, uh, it's actually translated into the Hebrew. I've loved you, I love you, and I will love you. It's, it's given some assurance. He's, he's, he's saying, I'm, you're, you're mine, and I'm yours, and we, 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 we are to go together. And then Malachi goes on to give some warnings, and it's a, it's a book from the prophet, uh, and, and, and he's telling the people to not worship God inauthentically, but instead to worship him in, with authentic authenticness and instead of superficially he asks a serious question uh, again and again of uh, of you may say this but I, but this is the answer basically and you might have said well, you have robbed us they said well how do you, how do you have you robbed god and he said by not giving your tithes and offerings and I said and you've just uh, you've come against the lord in this that you haven't taken care of you haven't loved the wife of your youth you've you've gotten rid of her you've, and, and just on a serious charge after serious charge and then giving an answer but god wanted to start with I have always loved you, says the Lord. It's a calm assurance, and in the midst of his charges, he knows that he's going to bridge the gap of where mankind is because we're about in the same place today in desperate need of a Savior. He knows that we've all fallen short of God's glory. We've all uh, transgressed. We've all sinned against God. None of us is just. No one is righteous. Romans says not even one. And the bridge that's going to come across Mal from Malachi to Matthew 400 years later is, is a bridge of a Savior. I think Micah 1 2 is included here to assure the people is that God is saying, I'm about to go silent. I'm about to go silent for a while. And I want you to remember I love you. I'm still with you. And maybe the people that drew strength from this years later, and like Zechariah, John the Baptist's dad, who who goes silent himself because he doesn't believe the angel and her thing's going to have a son named John making the way, paving the way for the Savior to come later. Well, God does break his silence 400 years later after Malachi from the Old Testament and the New Testament after 400 years of silent nights. This is how God 
breaks his silence is found in Matthew 123. The angel comes and says, A virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God assures us here. He, he, he calls his son the Savior. The Savior is going to come, and they're going to call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And I think it's so great. The first thing God wants to communicate to his people again is, I'm right here. I'm with you. I'm still with you. I, I, I've loved you. I love you. And I'll always love you. It goes with that Hebrews verse. As God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he's assuring us with that as soon as the silence is broken he assures us with that so what is God then doing in the silence does he not care is he trying to scare us is he asleep does he take off for, uh, for a run sometimes well 400 might seem like a big number to us again so we can just get that story we know from the New Testament the Bible clearly says a, a, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is like a day so for the Lord, it might be like he's sighing. <sighs> or for a half days, a thousand years, it might be like a morning fishing trip for the Lord. And the years just cruise by for us, but God outside of space and time. <sighs> so what is God doing in those years? Well, I want to go through three big things that happened during this time that we call as theologians things, the silent years between Malachi and Matthew that can help us at Christmas time. Three big things happened during this time. First, some of you have known, Philip of Macedon, which is uh, modern day Turkey, was known as Asia Minor back in biblical times. Philip of Macedon, he has a son, and his son is named Alexander. If you were in your Western Civ classes, you've heard his name is Alexander the Great, is what he's better known by. Genius military strategist. His military tactics are still studied today by different military personnel and, 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 and different countries still study the conquests of Alexander the Great. And he, he took over the entire Persian Empire, de defeated him, which is modern-day Iran. He, he destroyed me, and he would take people as slaves and, and conquer them. And, and if you know the story, uh, Alexander the Great went through a big time of depressions in, in his 30s. He was depressed because he made this comment, there's no other parts of the world that I haven't conquered. There's nothing left to conquer in the world. You imagine being such just a military person that's just gotten to the point to where you love war because you just love conquering and taking land proper. That's Alexander the Great. That's who he is. And with that, everywhere he would go, he'd take this Greek culture. He would take it with him. If you've seen the big fat Greek wedding and the father of the brides, everything he goes back to Greece, goes back to the Greeks. He was so proud of it, and, and, and well, Alexander the Great, he took everything Greek with him, and, and, and finally in his 30s, he dies, and there's different uh, controversy about how he dies. He was a heavy drinker, but he, they suddenly died of a flu and fever and things, but he's depressed at this time anyways because there's nothing else to conquer, but before he dies, he makes this statement that he would like the whole world, everything that touches his empire, to speak a common language, the language of the Greeks, which is Koine Greek. And so the Bible is written in Koine Greek because of Alexander the Great. Alexander thought he was conquering the world, but God was preparing the way to reveal himself to the world in the way they would understand. Second thing that happens is the drain, the, the, the drained energy and resources that Alexander that left behind him. Different generals and things kind of fought over in and, and, and different ways. They had some civil war and, and things that was happening uh, in, in the, the empires that he'd conquered and but it paved the way for a new, stronger empire to arrive on the scene. And it was called the Romans, the Roman Empire. And they brought some good ideas with them, and one of those was the idea of patrimona. It meant Roman peace. And they ruled with force and some harshness, but also they had a systems of laws and the ability to enforce them. We have some evidence of that with uh, the Apostle Paul who the Jews were going to lynch up because he was sharing about Jesus, this new sect known as the Way, this Christianity that he was taking with them, and the Jews were going to string him up with him and saw him as an apostate or a, 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 a heresy, a heretic. And they were going to string him up, and Paul says, I appeal to Caesar. And, and they'd already given him some lashings and things. The, the Roman government was just holding him. They didn't know about this Jewish mob that was going to come to kill him. And he appeals to Caesar and said, what? You're a Roman citizen? How come you didn't tell us? Well, so he was... 
he was due some respect. He was due under the laws. He was due a fair trial. And so they were going to ship him off to Rome. Why? Because he's a Roman citizen. Why? Because Rome had a system of laws. They were actually ordinary. They might have been harsh with them. They might have been deadly and enforcers and things, but they did have a system of laws. It was an orderly civilization. Patrimona was at work and where there was a Roman peace. My dad will often, every time we complain about the government or something, dad will remind me, so you know, some government is better than no government at all. Complete anarchy. Well, the Romans were some government. And we know from Romans 13, every government, every authority on earth has been established or allowed by God. Well, this Roman peace was doing something there. The third thing is the Romans improved the transportation system and safety with patrols and troop garrisons, long passages with, with good stone roads, and people could more easily travel around the known world. And there was more just cross-pollinization of ideas and resources and everything that transportation does for us today with our highway systems, and, and, and the world becomes much smaller and people are much less isolated. There's a flowing of ideas and technology and things, and this was true in the Roman world, and, and because of that, movements or new faiths to the world could travel much faster than they ever could before. The Romans thought they were just building an empire for themselves, but really the systems were in place for God's truths to be able to spread around the world. So here's three things. This is just so you remember or the, to, to, to review here. Common language, a Roman peace, an improved Roman transportation system were three things that made possible which would have been logistically impossible at the end of the Old Testament. Couldn't have been done. Couldn't have been done. And so from Malachi, what was happening in the silent ears from Malachi to Matthew is God was preparing the scene for his son to come. It's kind of like uh, Jeff Henson gives an illustration of this and talking, uh, talking about this idea. He says, it's really like when you go to a play. I used to go to a lot of plays, especially when Matt Stewart was around and doing the arsenic and old lace, different the plays at the high school and stuff. Well, you would go out to the lobby after some of the scenes to get some popcorn, and what was happening is while you're getting popcorn or something to drink, the students back in the auditorium are moving things around, preparing for the next scene. And so they're, they're stage crafting and they're, they're building stuff and they're, they're putting it in its place and things are getting moved around and it's all preparation. And while you're out getting popcorn, all this is going on. And it's the same with God as he's preparing this. He's preparing the world for something huge to come. He knew that the law, the plan always for mankind was redemption, relationship with God. But mankind went its own ways. Uh, mankind had a propensity to sin, and the law that he'd given us through the Mosaic law and, 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 and throughout the, all the, the prophets that they talked about only revealed how awful and bad off we were. It had no saving power. And you and I, we will make laws even for ourselves, or we'll see politicians make laws for other people that don't want to abide by themselves. We'll say, well, that's bad, but we'll be hypocrites because we will break even the own rules we make for ourselves. And God knew that about mankind, and they knew we needed a Savior. Paul understood this idea in the New Testament. He writes in Galatians 4, 4 through 5. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of as sons. What is the fullness of time? What is the fullness of time? Paul describes it as the fullness of time. It's like when there is an ability in common language, when there is improved systems for this word to spread, not just the language itself put in place, but the roads, the infrastructure, the systems are in place, and we can't have us a world completely at war people aren't going in place. The, the, the movement will have a hard time. So, so we'll bring a peace. Even use pagan empires. We talked last week how Augustus Caesar, Octavian, he thinks that he's just, he wants to be a god and he's just running things. Well, God uses even him to move a couple peasants to Bethlehem because Bethlehem is known by name to be uh, the house of bread. And we know Jesus to be called the bread of life. Well, here God is again. He uses in his sovereignty, even the pagans, even the unbelievers, even the heathen that would like to 
be the last people that would want to be used by God. God's running his economy. God's running history. That's why we say history is his story. God's story. And when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son born of a woman. Born under the law so that we might redeem those who are under the law. That we might receive the adoption as sons. For those who receive him, he's given the right to be called the children of God. So what God, what was he doing during the silent years? Well, just real simply, God was at work. God is always at work. Let me remember the Experiencing God study and series with Henry Blackaby, and he said, you know, you won't ever be able to keep up with God. He's always at work. He will wear you out. Sometimes the Christians will think, what is God up to? I don't think he's, he's silent. I don't think he's doing anything in the world. The world's going to pot. Now, God is always at work. And he was at work in the silent years. See, he's at the work in our lives when it seems like he's silent, when there's nothing going on, when he's not moving and working. He's working. So what should you and I be doing during the silent nights? When it's hard to see how God could possibly be working in the circumstances we find our life in. Well, I think, one, we remember at the birth of Christ, Christmas message is that he's our father and that he makes us alive. We were once dead in our sin. He said you were dead in your transgressions. We were once dead in our sin, but He makes us alive. We're alive. He makes us alive. Whether, whether you feel great today or not feeling well, one of the reasons God says He comes, He sent His Son, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life. I'm a pro-life guy. One of the reasons I'm a pro-life guy is because I serve the God of life. In every way. The wages of sin is death. The free gift of Jesus Christ is life. Life eternally. Life right now. Life abundantly. Life. He says he's life. The bread of life. Of the 2.8 million deaths reported to the Social Security Administration last year, approximately 14,000 people's names were incorrectly entered into their online database as dead. That many people. One out of 200 entries were reported as dead when they were very much alive and well. And so that's 38 life altering mistakes every day on the Social Security Board. One day, Laura Brooks, a 52 year old mother of two, suddenly stopped receiving disability checks. Then her loan payments and rent checks bounced. And she went to the bank to find out what the matter was. And the representative told her that her accounts had been closed because she was dead. They politely responded to her. They would only open her accounts if she could prove she was alive. <laughs> that government creativity at work. So what should we do as people that are alive? People that are children of God. You do what you do, or you do what you would do, if you believed in a loving God that cares about us deeply and that, uh, that, and that life uh, that he lived and gave to us transcends our current troubles, that's what we would do. You find ways to keep on living. And even when you feel lonely, even when you, when you feel dumped on or abandoned or when you're hurting or when you feel guilty or when you feel resentment or when you feel a lack of joy or even a lack of peace, you, you keep on marching in because we believe and that we are alive and we've been made alive in Christ and we act on that in our behavior. We should be very different than those who are dead in the world. I like this uh, article about a Nigerian pastor and if, you, if you've studied or, or just watched in the news really all the different things happening around different continents in the world. One of the places is in Africa in which people are persecuted for their faith. The Nigerian city of Jasits on Africa's great fault line between the Muslim North and Christian and thus has faced terrible things in recent years. A Nigerian Baptist church was attacked by Muslim extremists who burnt the church building and the house of the church's leader, Pastor Sunday Gamna. On the second Sunday of the violent outbreak when the people of the Baptist church returned for worship, they gathered in a little mud hall community center about one kilometer from the burnt church. Pastor Gamla stood up and offered some beautiful words of gratitude. He said, first I'm grateful that no one in my church killed anyone. Apparently during the chaos of the attacks, Pastor Sunday had gone around the community and some of the Muslim people said, Pastor, thank you for the way you taught your people. Your people helped to protect us. So 
Pastor Sunday was proud that his people did not kill any Muslims. Second, he said, I am grateful that they did not burn my church. Everyone looked at Pastor Sunday with disbelief. After all, everyone was meeting in a small, uncomfortable mud hut had been burnt because theirs had been burnt to the ground. But Pastor Sunday continued, Inasmuch as no church member died during this crisis, they did not burn our church. They only burned the building. We can rebuild the building, but we could not bring back to life any of our members. So I am grateful that they did not burn my church. He continued, Third, I am grateful that they burned my house as well. If they had burned your house and not my house, how would I have known how to serve you as a pastor? However, because they burned my house and all my possessions, I know that you are experiencing, and I will be able to be a better pastor to you. So I am grateful that they burned my house as well. I think sometimes you ever feel like maybe we're a little spoiled here in the, the United States. Although persecution may very well be, be coming at deeper levels than maybe what some of you have experienced, but over 60 countries in the world where it's illegal to be known as a Christian, where either put in prison or put to death. I wonder if this pastor, if these people ever feel like God is silent. So where are you? Where's your protection? Where, where is it? Or to have a, just an outlook and acting the way you would when you believe that there was an omnipresent and omnipotent loving God that cared so much about us that he called us his kids how we would act, how we would behave, how we would respond during times of seemingly silence. I think we also need to lean on what we know to be true from the Word of God. Words that go beyond common knowledge and wisdom. The Bible informs us what is truly needed and important for one's life and how to relate to people in times of joy, but also in great pain. It tells us how to relate. Sometimes people will ask, you know, Alan, does a God talk to you? And I say, yeah, every day. Really, like, what does he sound like? Well, he sounds a lot like the Bible. Because God uses the Bible as his word. And his Holy Spirit and his word work together to communicate with us. And I, I can sense him and his presence and speaking to me from his Bible. Well, Paco Amador, a pastor in a little village in Chicago's west side, he lives in a neighborhood rife with gang violence. And he tells the following story about being invited to, to lead a prayer vigil for a young man who had been gunned down by a rival gang. He said, when I arrived at the vigil, a large crowd of young people, including many known gang members, had already gathered around the sidewalk where I would be praying. I wondered, what should I do? What should I say? I felt fearful and inadequate, yet I also knew that they had gathered for this prayer vigil. So amid my fears, I prayed silently, Jesus, what do you want me to do here? As I looked out over the crowd, I realized most of these scary-looking gang members were just kids, mostly in their mid-teens or some of them in their 20s. I was old enough to be their father. They had surely been told repeated times by authority figures how wrong their actions were and how foolish gang activity was. But as I looked at these hurting teenagers, I wondered what would Jesus say to these young people? So I asked permission to speak from my heart. And then I said, since most of you are half my age and I am the age of your fathers, would you allow me to address you on behalf of your fathers? I know you have heard plenty of times that this back and forth violence in our neighborhoods is complete nonsense. You've been told how destructive gang behavior is, but today on behalf of your dads, I want to say to you what should have been said a long time ago. My son, my daughter, would you forgive me for not being there for you when you were little? Will you forgive me for not being there when you took your first steps? Will you forgive me for not being there to play catch with you when you're young? Will you forgive me for leaving you when you most needed me? As the words poured from my lips, I could not control myself, and tears ran slowly down my cheeks. To my surprise, many of them started to weep with me. And something special happened in that moment. Following the gathering, they started to trust me, even though I had no credibility in their world. And I hadn't shared their life, but I had shared their pain. the message of Christmas is that God is with you. God is with me. He shares in your joys. He shares in our pain. He loves us. Even when he is silent. One pastor said this, the point I really want to make today is when you hear God's silence and feel his absence, 
trust his presence. When you're wondering if he's there, I, God, are you there? Do you care? Do you still love? Do you still change lives? Are you still making a difference? Because I just, I'm just looking at the world. I'm reading the paper. I'm experiencing all the if, impacts and effects of living in a dead world, a fallenness. And I'm being disheartened. Sometimes I'm feeling defeated. But the message of Christmas is remember not just the silent night, but remember what God was doing during all of those silent nights. And I think that helps us to, to get through, to keep going when we don't sense God's presence. You know, He was at work, even using people that were as ungodly as ungodly gifts. He used them to get across what he wanted to do in this world. This time of invitation, I just want us to remember this Christmas message. I wanted to remember that this is a message we can bring into our own hearts. When you confess Christ as your Lord and Savior, he will come and make his home with you. It says in Romans, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And you can experience his salvation. You can experience Christmas and all its truth and his realness can come to you. And whether you are in a joyful mood or whatever emotional feeling you're having for the day, you can know he's there because he promises to be. This time, I'm going to ask you to stand and, and sing some praise songs with us. And